welcome everybody to this uh, to this webinar from from the Founder Institute. Uh, my name is Jonathan Grichen. I am a co-founder of the Founder Institute, and we re have a really awesome topic that we're going to talk about today. Okay, and and really quick, I'm going to upload a presentation here just so I can take us off the little the little chicklick screen. But hey, everybody, how's it going? Um, we have over 1,000 people registered today, which is amazing. And I know that we have people from something like 60 countries too. So welcome. Uh, tell us where you're from. Engage. Uh, we do have somebody in the chat uh, right over here who is uh, taking all of your questions and, and interacting in there. So please don't be shy. Go into the chat. Um, this event is brought to you by the Founder Institute, which is the world's largest pre-seed startup accelerator. Uh, you can learn about any of our programs at at fi.co and see any of our enrolling programs from all around the world at fi.co slash enrolling. Okay, so here's my little, my fix. And as soon as I do this, ah, look at that, see? Quick, quick bugs to get out of there. Uh, for whatever Good reason, this webinar platform always starts you in a mode where it thinks you're in uh, a presentation. But um, for anybody, if you're like the Founder Institute right now and you're moving a lot of events online, uh, it's a little bit of Murphy's Law, right? Something is, is bound to go wrong, so uh, have a backup plan. All right, so uh, with that being said, we have a really amazing topic today for this event, okay? And, and myself and Chris, uh, who's the speaker, and I'll introduce him in a moment, you know, when we were discussing, like, hey, let, let's, let's, do, let's do a webinar, let's do a chat together, we were discussing the topic. And basically, you know, the... What, has, what is happening right now in the world is the single largest global disruption to our society since World War II, which ended 75 years ago, okay? And as a result, I mean, it is it has thrown the world into chaos. Um, I mean, the number of people that are, that are getting uh, laid off, the financial hardships, you know, we wanna make sure like this is, this is a really, really bad time for a lot of people. Um, and, but today we are going to try to focus on the positive. Okay, when there is disruption in the world, uh, that's where entrepreneurs live, right? Change creates opportunity, and it's a really good uh, time, and th it's actually the best time for entrepreneurs that can kind of look at that change, see where the world is going, and start to basically build the future, not just the future jobs in their city or the future you know, fi financial um, status of their, of their family, but literally the future economy and the future of our society. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to focus on all of the negative that's happening on the world. How can we look to the future as entrepreneurs to find positives? And um, I can't probably have a, a better, a better uh, guest today as uh, Chris Kelly. He's, he's probably the, the most positive person I've ever met in my entire life, to be honest with you. Um, Thanks, so, uh, and just really quick, Chris, before I allow you to introduce yourself, um, Chris and I did say that we go way back is sort of an understatement. Um, we, uh, since uh, kindergarten, uh, yeah. <laughs> middle school, high school, college, and then we also uh, moved out um, to, to to do some skiing in, in our in our late twenties. And um, Chris also was, and uh, his mother was my second grade teacher, Mrs. Kelly. If you're watching, hi. Um, and uh, and Chris also was he participated in the first Founder Institute cohort uh, all the way back in, in 2009. So um, yeah, Chris, uh, welcome. Glad to have you on here. I want you to take a second and introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. Thanks to all you guys for tuning in from around the world. Uh, I mean, John, you guys have, have, have built an incredible platform and it's been amazing to watch you do it over the years. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a lifelong entrepreneur. Uh, I, I started slinging candy in, in the back of the school bus as, as a little kid. And, I did and that I too, started, the, lemon, the lemon shots, right? Or what were they called? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> lemon heads. Yeah. Uh, or um, warheads. Warhead. Yeah, there you go. Uh, we're dating ourselves though. And, you know, but I've had a lot of different business ventures. Uh, the, the two largest businesses that I founded, uh, one is Evo Jets Charter, which is um, a private jet charter business. We deliver uh, global jet services around the world. Um, we've aggregated a fragmented network of about 5,000 privately owned planes uh, in, into a serviceable network. Um, and even right now in, during COVID where uh, you know, we're, we're experiencing uh, your, your regular travel has declined significantly. Uh, we just opened up a, a new arm of our business in cargo, and uh, we have, I think, six flights a month right now running 
uh, jumbo jets between Hong Kong and LA to get some uh, masks to people there. So, um, you know, there's opportunity presenting itself. Uh, and then uh, I started that business uh, almost 15 years ago with uh, the woman who's now my wife, um, and she's my co-founder. And uh, and then in 2009, in the middle of a downturn, started Convene. Uh, and Convene is uh, one of the largest players in the United States in the flexible workspace and full service conferencing business. Uh, we have over a million square feet of conferencing space. And we started that business, my partner, Ryan Simonetti and I, uh, we started that business in 2009, which uh, for those of you guys who remember, that was a, you know, a, a very serious recession um, that felt a lot like the environment that we have today. And we were two 27 year old kids who had a vision for how to reinvent the commercial real estate business, uh, which was a bold and crazy idea. But in retrospect, uh, we look back at that moment and realize that that window of time, uh, that uh, that atmosphere of chaos and change um, really created a, a window that was a relatively short window where somebody, where two guys like us were able to build a business like the one we did. It's where all the incumbents, they had their guard down and we were able to step in and uh, you know build something great out of um, a sea of uncertainty. And, and I, I think that that feels a lot like where we are right now. And uh, you know, not surprisingly, I, after 10 years, I left Convene uh, in December and I was kind of waiting for things to slow down again. I, I didn't want to start a business uh, when things were frothy. And, uh, and, and I'm back at it again, so we, we could talk about that later. But that, that's my, my brief intro uh, kind of over the past 15 years of my entrepreneurial career. Yeah, and um, Chris is also the only person to ever be recognized twice by Inc. Magazine's 30 under 30 list for most promising young entrepreneurs. So he's being a little bit, uh, a little bit modest right <laughs> now, but um, you can look him up. Uh, well, Chris Kelly is one of the more common names in the world, but Chris Kelly Convene, you can find out about him um, and, and check out what he's up to. But um, so, yeah, here, here's what we're going to do today. All right. And the first thing that I want to make very clear to everybody is that um, during this chat, you can go on YouTube. You can go any number of places to just find uh, you know, a pre-recorded chat to, to learn about stuff. OK, the whole point of these webinars is to interact with you, the audience. So at any time during our chat, please, you should, should be doing it now. And oh, wow, I'm looking at the chat. People are saying where they're from. We got Paris, India, Nigeria, Madrid, Minneapolis, Sri Lanka, South Africa, Iran, Navid from Iran. That's awesome. So Naveed from, from Iran, um, Neil from South Africa, Adriana, please uh, put your questions into the chat. Uh, we have somebody in there from the Founder Institute team. They're going to be collecting your questions. They're going to be feeding them to me, and we're going to pepper them in through our, our conversation. Okay, we want to get to your questions. That's sort of the whole point of this event. Um, now, with that being said, uh, we, we put together a little bit of agenda to, to just sort of guide the discussion, um, and we want to pepper your questions in, so please get them in. Um, but the agenda is going to be is, you know, the first thing we're going to talk about is, is to go back into Chris's story, right? How in 2009, which was the last major crisis, um, you know, in the global economy, how the how Convene was built, right? And, and kind of what the situation was there and try to see some of the lessons that Chris learned there. And then the second part of the discussion is we want to get into, you know, what, uh, what are the parallels? What are the things that we can look at in the current situation that we're going through where entrepreneurs can, can kind of make some decisions and look at some opportunities to, to move forward in the future? Okay. So with that being said, I'm going to put uh, Chris's more handsome face on screen here and we'll get started. So um, it was 2009. Right. And, and by the way, Founder Institute was also started in 2009. And it's a it yeah. kind of a it's 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 almost against every reflex that people will have that when the economy is in such turmoil, that that is actually the time to build a business. Right. Um, was this something back then? You know, this, we're all 10 years younger. I mean, is that something you, you knew when you guys started thinking about this idea or was that that just come on like happenstance? It's actually the understanding that we were in this window of uncertainty and chaos and change. That was the catalyst for us even thinking about what business we'd get into. So, um, you know, I, I'll never forget, uh, I was sitting uh, on my balcony and I, I got a phone call from my co-founder at the time, Ryan Simonetti. This is one of your, and, your best friends from college, right? 
Yep. Yeah. One of my best friends from college and he and I, we had two businesses in college together selling uh, uh, used textbooks and also uh, ticketed events. Um, but you know, he called me up and he's he's a, a, a student of Warren Buffett. And Warren Buffett famously said, be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. Yep. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I don't want to make light of the moment and the hardship and how much my heart aches for people who are out there in the world today, where um, you know, there, a lot of people are, are experiencing uh, major health issues and financial distress and, and other traumatic issues. Um, and uh, there's a lot of people out there, healthcare workers, who uh, we all um, owe a debt of gratitude to. So I, I don't want to be uh, coming across as taking advantage of the situation. But I... I kind of want to pose a challenge to the thousand people who are on this call from around the world, which is that if you're somebody who self identifies as an entrepreneur, then this is the time that we move. And it's, it's not really because we're greedy. It's because um, small businesses are the number one driver of growth creation and job creation in the world. And this is, uh, this is when we are needed most. And this is when the optimism that is inherent in entrepreneurs, this is when the problem solving capability and the resourcefulness and the scrappiness and the grittiness of entrepreneurs, this is the moment where those natural entrepreneurial skill sets and attributes, this is when those are most valuable. And so if you're not playing those cards today, then uh, there's really no better time to be playing them. So um it just uh, yeah, I think that we have a sense of responsibility as people who identify as entrepreneurs to really be thinking hard about how to solve problems today. And for me, I'm not a medical professional, so I, I can't save people's lives, um, but I can try to uh, guard people's livelihoods and uh, and try to create new jobs and and business opportunities for other people, and also you know for the for um, the benefit of my own family. So right. um, and every, going, that's just a step like every single big company right now is in a massive reorg reshuffle. Big companies are slow inherently right now. They are they're like slots moving. They're not going to move fast. So we can't say, oh, uh, Microsoft's going to figure it out. Google's going to figure that out. No, they're not. And the same thing can be said about governments too, right? For for a lot of the a lot of the uh, the problems that we're seeing. And yeah, as entrepreneurs, we're the ones that are flexible and can move quickly in times of disruption. Right? John, I think to to further that point, you know, um, I I have a lot of friends who are CEOs of large publicly traded businesses, and right now, two hundred percent of their time, I mean, they're completely maxed out in just figuring out how to organize the yeah. the operations that they have they they don't have the ability to think really beyond the day to day they can't think any further into the future than just trying to get through the day because of all of the assets and operations they have so this is a moment in time that actually advantages people that have nothing to people yeah. who have a clean slate and a clean start you have nothing to complicate nothing your, to lose uh, too in some nothing way. to lose yeah. no, nothing to complicate um uh, you know, your, your day to day. And so this is, I, I think it's you know, a, a great time to start. So you know, I'll, I'll go back to that phone call uh, that I had with Ryan. And this was in 2009. And, and uh, you know, the, the world was really in, in a tailspin. I think you know, what we're going through right now is, is a greater disruption, but um, the fundamentals of our economy are actually more sound now than they were in 2009, uh, at least for the time being. And uh, Ryan said to me, uh, we're about to experience the largest transfer of wealth that the world has ever seen. And we have to figure out how to be on the on the winning end of that. And uh, just for the sake of clarity, uh, both Ryan and I don't come from any type of background where we have you know, family financing or anything like that. We're both scrappy kids. Um, and, you know, so we started, he and I started thinking about all these different business concepts. We, we that was the, the, the mortgage uh, crisis. So we were thinking about how can we help banks resolve mortgages or other things. There were all these different ideas that we had. And we, um, we had the good fortune of stumbling upon an opportunity where we saw very large corporations who were trying to, uh, trying to um, take real estate and move it off their balance sheet. And what we the, the simple understanding that we had was that uh, conference, large conference, 
large conference centers for Fortune 500 type companies were simultaneously the most expensive type of real estate to own and operate and were also the least utilized. And so we had this idea that we could actually wholesale kind of outsource that um, that part of their business. And what we ended up doing was we were sort of leasing existing pre-built conference facilities off of corporate balance sheets and then turning them into conference venues that were open to the public. Right. Um, so you, and had, so that was, you had big companies in New York City who during frothy times were building their own conference centers. Now it's not frothy times. They have these conference centers. They're cutting jobs. It's it's a recession. Yeah. They're doing all this stuff. They need to get stuff off their office sheets. You're seeing an unrealized, you know, an asset that's not being put to use to put to use. And worse off, it's actually it's it's harming the people that own the assets, right? Yeah. And so I, I, there are in in frothy times, you have wasteful behavior. Um, and then I think when the market dips, that resourceful people could go and try to make sense of. Uh, you know, repurposing that um, those types of assets, uh, and so that's that's what we did. And you know, we started with very limited resources. Uh, we started with extremely limited capital, um, and from that starting point of just one location, uh, you know, we we now have thirty plus locations in seven different cities, and uh, you know, eight hundred team members. So um, you know, we've come a long way. So there's a lot of people in here asking some questions. So we're going to go through. Um, what Chris did, and then I promise the second half of it is like, okay, how can we take some of those lessons of what we can do in the future? And and this is something I think Chris, we we discussed this uh, last night when we were just kind of prepping for this for this call. But I knew that a lot of people were going to ask about funding, okay? Yeah. Um, because that's it's actually why the Founder Institute was started. By the way, it was because people just think they need funding when actually they need like fifty other things before they need funding. But um, a lot of people are asking about funding, but in times uh, like when you guys started to build Convene, right? Funding probably was not readily available, but um, but something like talent was, right? Right. Um, and I know I know that you you know, and just for anyone who doesn't know, Chris is that's sort of his thing is that he builds culture, he builds teams, he he builds all of that you know the the amazing workforces that can, can that can build something awesome. So um, you know, at that time, so you saw the kind of the the opportunities, the waste that was happening. Um, but then you guys were also able to hire some great people, right? Yeah, so uh, it, this is the this is the question that, that we get most frequently uh, as entrepreneurs, which is uh, you know, how do you go from zero to one? Yep. Uh, there's this chicken or egg thing, which is like, you know, if I had a great business, then I could find the capital. But if I, you know, I need the capital in order to build a great business. And uh, to that, I always say there's the chicken and the egg, and then there's the founder. Um, and it's our job to kind of you know, overcome that impossible hurdle. And one of the reasons why recessions uh, are a moment when people can go from zero to one and why entrepreneurs mobilize in, in, in these times is because um, the number one reason why you need capital is to have access to talent. Um, but there's a lot of people who have lost their jobs, a lot of extremely talented people who would otherwise, even potentially with unlimited funds, would have been out of the reach of uh, of a startup who doesn't have any you know any existing momentum or credibility or um, or, or certainty for people to quit their otherwise good jobs uh, to to go and work in your startup. But you know we have six million people in the United States in the past week that have been laid off. I know of entire tech companies who have uh, laid off and you know entire groups and, and departments and those people are available today to work for option value. Um, you know, this is when you can potentially find, you know, your technical co-founder or your development team. You can offer equity incentives and things and people will work for free. Uh, right now I'm spinning up a new venture and there's all these corporate lawyers who usually bill a thousand bucks an hour who are willing to actually help us to create our formation and foundational documents um, on the promise only future business with no current payment because they're just not busy right now. So uh, I would say to the, to, the, uh, to the capital issue is you need to figure out how to be resourceful. Um, for talent, you can, you know, you, people will are willing to lend their time for, you know, to, to a certain degree um, and work for the, for the, uh, on the promise of future option value and potentially for you know, some type of equity exchange. Um, and so talent is more available than ever before. Now, in terms of uh, you know other assets, there there are other things that you can do uh, to lessen the startup costs. 
Um, when we started Convene, which is we're essentially in the hospitality business, we have things like catering operations and tons of staffing and audiovisual and technical services and event production. Um, you know, one of the challenges that you have early on in any business is that your revenue is very uncertain and is often kind of intermittent and inconsistent. Um, one of the one of the strategies that we used early on at Convene was. Uh, Whereas eventually we ended up having all of our own team members, um, we outsourced everything to third party vendors so that all of our costs were on a variable basis. And so if we actually had a client who wanted to book a, an event, we would then spin up the contractors who would come. And the only time that we would actually have to pay was when we knew that we had revenue in hand. Um, you know, you can start trying to orient things on a variable cost basis. Um, the, the disadvantage of that is you have a lack of control over quality. Um, it, and it's often said that the, you know, kind of the quality uh, in the early days of a business is something that founders are embarrassed of later on in their careers, which is you know, very much true uh, for every business I've ever started. Yep. Um, and then with time, you vertically integrate. You know, once you have more consistency in revenue, once you have more visibility uh, you know, into, into your future finances, then you can start to onboard people on a more permanent basis. Right. So the cost of doing business, generally speaking, I mean, if you look at the world right now, right, and the things have changed ridiculously quickly, right? A month ago, um, signing those same kind of contracts with caterers, right, just using this example with any, and yes, we're using a very specific example, but this could be really any vendor, service provider, technology provider, whatever. Mm -hmm. They might be requiring you to sign a one-year contract, right? Yeah. In frothy times. But guess what? Now we're not in frothy times. So now you can actually control it. You can control your balance sheet a lot better. Um, and similarly speaking with with all of the available talent. And it's not just, oh, they're cheaper. It's also just the the, the amazing people that have been let go, right? It's not like, available. Yeah. It's not like um, these big companies yeah. are letting people go because they suck. They're letting people go because they're they're in war mode and they have to save their business, right? Very, very smart people are flooding the market right now that typically you would never be able to compete with a large company to get these kind of people, right? And John, adding to that, you know, even more valuable than the individual person is that this is a time where you can actually pick up an entire team. That's amazing. Right. So, I mean, you can, there, there, there are entire departments that have just been just completely laid off. That's usually and how it works. They just, yeah. They, yeah. It's, uh, sure. I mean, and, and so here, and, and I, I mean, I know of many companies who have had to make this painful decision of letting go of really, not even really great people, but really great teams of people. And though you, you can basically, you know, those people are sitting at home. They don't, they don't have a job right now. They, and, and it's very hard to go and get a job. Um, you could potentially go and find teams like that that are already cohesive and fully functioning um, and then roll them in. But what those people are going to be looking for is they're going to be looking for your vision. You know, in order to in order for them to follow, you have to lead. And what that means is that you have to paint a really clear picture of what the, the future looks like enough that, you know, enough that they're going to believe and enough that they're going to follow. Um, and you know, there's a certain amount of, uh, of even kind of theater that comes across in entrepreneurship where you have to realize that you as the founder are kind of the beacon that, uh, that other people want to follow. And you have to assume that they may have some competing opportunities that are uh, you know, on a similar uh, pay basis. And what you want to be is you want to be the most certain and the most enthusiastic and the most positive and the most well thought through um, and just have a real clarity of your vision enough that uh, you know, people want to get behind you. Yeah. And right now, the vision, your, how you see things working out in the future is it's always important for an entrepreneur. Right. But right now, it's like triply important um, because the present in a lot of ways kind of sucks. <laughs> um, and we all know that, you know, it's it's going to it's going to boil over at some point and we'll, we'll be okay. It's going to roll over, but whatever the future looks like is going to be a little bit different. And um, yeah. we all, we all need to, to take a part in that. So let me look at some other stuff here. So just going on timing, right? So you guys, so you and uh, Ryan, your, your co-founder for convene um, back in 2009, you, you saw this kind of convergence of, of, uh, of opportunity and trends, right? Um, and, it, you you saw that you were able to to sort of move quickly and, and get some great people on board because of the 
the the low cost of doing business those days. Let's get into a little bit what you were saying of, you know, just moving quickly and being embarrassed by what you put out there. Um, I would venture to guess that the, that when you guys first started, it was probably a very embarrassing organization, and yeah. we were just trying to figure out what would work in an environment where people's, you know, the consumer behavior, everything was changing at the same time, right? So, want to talk through that a little bit? Yeah, you know, I. I think the, the state that you want to reach is where the, the customers maybe don't realize how chaotic it is. Like you kind of want the chaos in the back of the house, kind of your duck on a pond. Um, uh, but you know, things are not necessarily going to be perfect on day one. And so one of the, one of the challenges that a lot of people have, especially there's a lot of entrepreneurs who are coming from a, a larger corporation where everything has been you know, polished and well thought through and, and are kind of through their, their early messy days is, realize that what what you do on day one does not have to be scalable. And in fact, what you do on day one is usually not scalable. Um, a lot of times the way that you solve the chicken or egg issue with, you know, how do I find capital before I have a company? Um, a lot of times it's about being opportunistic. And, you know, there's a difference between being opportunistic and then being strategic and scalable, right? So opportunistic is you may find a, you know, a, a, a unique circumstance where you can create value. But maybe there's not a clear path to creating scale past that. But if, if, you, can find, uh, if you can find a place to get a little bit of a foothold, to get a little bit of traction, uh, where you can start to build a team, where you can start to retain talent, then once you, kind of, you, know, once you have that one single thing that maybe not scalable, not particularly beautiful, operation up and running, but but enough to be able to sustain your team and gain a little bit of traction, you know, then in, in the next phase, you can start to think about, all right, well, you know, how do we start to resolve some of the inefficiencies or imperfections? How do we start to think about, you know, a larger, more scalable business that's chasing a larger total addressable market? Um, and that's usually when, you know, businesses will kind of pivot. Um, but don't don't be don't be afraid or embarrassed to to pursue something that is opportunistic and maybe a one-off. Um, I know you. I know you. This moment in time, did some stuff that you know was. So why don't you talk about some of you know the actual the hustle, right? So this is Chris now, yeah. <laughs> company, hundreds of employees, m multiple locations, right? Uh, bring me back to the during the recession when you're you're seeing these opportunities and trends converge. You see, oh wow, I think there's there's a market here. You guys start like wh what are like literally day to day? Like what were you guys doing at that time? everything our job description was was anything that had to get done and so we were you know we were bussing tables i remember one time we were uh, we were interviewing a chef and the kitchen was so overwhelmed that the chef that we were interviewing ryan and i all started scrambling cracking and scrambling eggs in the kitchen uh in the middle of this guy's job interview and the guy he felt so bad for us he, he worked the rest of the day just to help us out at the end of the day, he's like, I'm never going to work for you guys. I'm like, good luck. But I, he just, he helped us for that one day. Um, you know, I remember, we, like I said, we would we would kind of sell the events and then subsequently staff them. I remember one day somebody said, you know, they, they needed 10 flat screen TVs. I said, oh yeah, no problem. Ran down the street, you know, we maxed out our credit card, bought the flat screens and I was, we were rolling them down Lexington Avenue in New York on, on dollies. And I had to grease the guy at, at Best Buy to stay open late so we can go back and get the second bunch. But like, these are the types of things that you do uh, in, you know, in, in early days. Um, one of the benefits of kind of really getting your hands dirty as a founder is that you can, you have a deep understanding of every single position, uh, what needs to be done in each one of those jobs. And then when you're, when you're actually interviewing people later on, you, know, you are super powered, you know, all the right questions to ask, you know, exactly what that job is supposed to function like, what good looks like. Um, you know, and, and you have to be willing to basically do absolutely whatever it takes. You know, one thing uh, that was unique to the recession, I, I remember early on having conversations with our sales team. And I was like, why are our spaces not filled? And they said, well, you know, the, the market's down 30%. And my answer to that was, well, we're not trying to take 100% market share. I'm trying to take one or two percent market share of a of in New York, what was a multi-billion dollar business. And I just walked through all these hotels in New York and I saw them having meetings. 
I don't need every single meeting in New York, but if we just could get one or 2% of those meetings. So I would literally go and you know, walk around the hotels and speak to people who were at the, the, the conference organizers who would be at the table. And I would just walk through the hotel and, and I would give them my business card and I would tell, I would basically just, you know, cut and paste that revenue into my locations, whatever it took, I would do. But you know, there's a, a lot of people are, are going to make excuses and they're going to harp on the fact that, well, the market's down 20% or 30% or 50%. I don't care. All I want is 1% of that market. And I want the types of salespeople who are going to go and hustle and fill my space. I'm not trying to cure the entire economy. I'm just trying to, you know, I'm just trying to, to uh, maximize the capacity of, of my particular business. A down market is still a market. Right. Absolutely. There's still things are still being bought and sold. Uh, it's just shifted from here to here. <laughs> and um, yeah, especially with entrepreneurs, like they don't have anything invested in over here. Right. Big companies have built all they built floors, buildings, infrastructures, processes to function over here. And now it's moved over here. So that's yeah. that's where entrepreneurs need to go. OK, so we're yeah. getting a ton of questions. So I'm going to start to shift the conversation now more towards the questions from the audience. Wow. Uh, Virginia, who's a, a member of the marketing team who's in the chat. Thank you. You're doing a good job. Um, and everybody in the chat, you're also doing a good job. Uh, Michelle, Bill, Sarah, Jess, everybody. Thank you. Um, this is, this is great. We've got a lot of great questions here. So we're going to start and, and obviously, um, people, the majority of these questions, there was some funding stuff. We kind of went over that, but a lot of them are about, okay, that was 2009. Now, now we're, we're here. Right. So, um, you know, uh, Joe, Joe Sue, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, is asking, okay, like that was 2009 and, and, and Diviat as well, you know, where that was then, this is now. So that was then mortgage crisis, real estate was, was one of these places where the, that, that was happening. You know, how do you recommend somebody look at what's going on now um, and try to see how they could take similar steps moving forward? So the, the, um, the, the lens that you want to view the world through is you want to ask yourself the question, what do you think with a high degree of certainty will be different in, uh, you know, in three years or four years or five years time from now in response to what the world is experiencing right now? You know, think, think about, you know, go through uh, every aspect of your day go through, you know, put yourself in the shoes of, of every executive in every position in every single industry, whichever one that you might be closest to, and just try to imagine what the future state is. And, you know, what is something that is different uh, that you have a high degree of certainty that you could see today? The other thing to look for is where do you see people improvising uh, in creating solutions for things today that you think uh, will event will become formalized and part of our uh, the future of our everyday life. So just like as an example for that, I went to the grocery store the other day and there was a plexiglass shield between myself and and the cashier. And you know I had the thought, okay, well, you know I don't know how many cash registers there are in the country, you know millions that probably every single cash register in the country uh, and in the world will start to have some type of shield between the cashier and the user. I mean, that's a niche business where if somebody wanted to go and manufacture, you know, a, a better solution for that, you know, they had just, they had just cut a piece of plexiglass and hung it from the ceiling with, uh, yeah. with fishing wire. But like, there's a whole business to be made there. And that's just, I mean, that's just one, you know, random anecdote, but. Um, well, let's, let's, I mean, take that right and bring it back to the problem that that's solving right the problem that that's solving is that people are afraid and or cautious about going out in public and and having social contact with people yes we're in the middle of a pandemic but when we come back after when when things start to quote unquote normalize there's still going to be that hesitation right so there's going to be a whole whether it's a plexiglass shield or or um you know just Gloves, I mean, just anything that makes people feel more comfortable interacting in public, right? And you could think about how many applications there are, and it's not just physical, there's digital applications there too. Yeah, like those are those are the things that are gonna to start to define the future. Yeah, um, so in, another area, and this is where I'm, I'm looking right now, is there are a lot of companies that have intellectual property um, that 
there, you know, they, there are a lot of companies that, that need cash in their balance sheet, and they may have some random piece of intellectual property that they're trying to shed so that they can focus on their core business and, and kind of uh, you know, solidify their balance sheet. And so right now, I'm negotiating uh, more than one conversation with large companies that have certain type of technology that I think has a good future application. You know, these companies need to focus on just resolving their, uh, you know, protecting their core business right now. Um, and so you can pick things like that off now uh, on, on the you know on the cheap as well. But in general, I, I think that the the best lens through which to see the world is just try to try to look into the future, imagine the future state of kind of you know, if you were to plot the trends forward from here, um, and you know and, and then build something around that. And you know there's going to be a lot of people who are making masks and stuff like that. I think you. Know, look and think about not not just what the kind of immediate first turn of reactions are, but think about what the chain of reactions are and try to find something that maybe other people aren't, uh, you know, aren't competing for. Like the whole idea of making masks, I, you know, I think that, that that ship probably sailed and, and the big guys will be chasing that. But you know, for any market like that, like if that's going to be, in, you think about what, what are the niches that are, that may be, um, that 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 may be adjacent to that or correlated with with that or that you know, that 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 general um, the, the, whatever's driving whatever theme is driving that and then kind of play that out through the world, right? And yeah, I just want to be clear there too. Like, yeah, we're not telling you guys to build masks, right? It's like the problem that it's solving is that people don't feel comfortable interacting with other people. Like that is going to persist for a while, even after all these lockdown ends. Right. Somebody mentioned here, you know, what about remote work? Yeah. Um, I would venture to guess that a lot of people watching this webinar today, like this isn't something you would have done three weeks ago. Right. It doesn't mean that everybody's going to work remotely. It just means that this kind of stuff is going to be much more common. Right. So it doesn't mean you need to build the Zoom killer. It means, OK, well, what are the other challenges of managing a remote team, communicating, networking remotely? There's there's a million different things that can build off of that. Now, Daniel is asking, um, and this kind of went back to before, right? You, you mentioned wasteful behavior from frothy times, which was, you know, basically created the opportunity for you guys uh, with Convene. Um, is there, you know, Daniel's asking like pros and cons of starting a business in an industry that it's hit heavily, right? Which was sort of, you know, that idea it was frothy times, wasteful behavior versus one that there it's really not affecting. I mean, do you, if you were to just kind of start and, and is there one way you would go? I mean, you went one way before. Is there another way that you think might be? Yeah, well, I, I think that there's different advantages to both, right? So if you if you go into an industry that's broken, the entrepreneurial opportunity is being the being the person who builds the company that helps put the pieces back together right. in a way that uh, is um, that's compatible with the new normal. You know, going into an existing industry, one that is uh, less affected, your advantage there is your access to talent, right? There's going to be people who were in affected industries that have a certain skill set that are going to want to relocate into a non-affected industry where they have some type of career stability. Um, and so yeah, I just think it's a different play. And, you know, in, in one space, you're kind of recreating an industry, um, you know, and potentially being able to pick up broken pieces cheaply and stitch them back together into something that works. And then on the other hand, it's uh, I think just the general access to talent right now is something that can be applied to any industry. Um, I think that the answer to the question of which one you should pursue is where do you have the closest opportunity? Where is your network relevant? Where do you have access? I mean, there's going to be there's going to be thousands of millionaires that are minted out of this change. Uh, if not, you know, tens of thousands. Um, you don't need to be the next Jeff Bezos. You just want to be the next person who's figured out how to go from, you know, being the solo entrepreneur sitting, you know, at home trying to figure something out to being a company that's, you know, worth 50 to $100 million, which um, there are a lot of. And there, you, know, you can, somebody who's a real entrepreneur can kind of build those things. So, you know, that, that my advice would be is, um, you know, try to think about where you have the, the most access or where you see an opportunity um, and then just take one step forward, you know, just start to explore it, start to sniff around uh, and see, you know, see where that takes you. If you feel like you're going down a dead end, don't be afraid to, you know, to, to turn back around and, and start the, start over again. 
uh, you know, Ryan and I had several businesses, several, several business concepts uh, that we were trying to go through before Convene became a reality. Um, and right now I'm currently pursuing several different business concepts. And you know, I, I know that I'll probably only go through with, you know, one of them, maybe two of them, but I'm not shy about pursuing multiple uh, at the same time. So I had a couple questions here, Aaron, um, you know, Gordana, Stephanie, all, all had questions kind of related to, uh, there's a lot of noise going on right now, right? So a lot of businesses, especially it seems like, well, I guess it could apply to both B2B and B2C, but a lot of noise going on right now. You know, how do you break through when you were starting to have these discussions with large companies or other people, break through the noise of, you know, when, when everybody probably has is might be looking at their bank accounts or something like that. Like, was there any experience you guys had doing that back in 2009? Yeah, I mean, you could you could wake up in the morning and you could inundate yourself with, you know, all the COVID stuff. Uh, and I, of course, we all want to be generally available, uh, gen generally aware of this. But I mean, you could make you could make COVID your full time job. Um, what what you really want to be thinking of if you're trying to build something is you're not building a company for today or tomorrow or for six months or now. You're building a company and you're basically trying to identify a point, you call it 18 months in the future, where you think that uh, you can you know, start to have the nucleus of something that in five years from now could be you know, worth tens of millions of dollars. You want to you wanna be somebody who's thinking about those waypoints. You know, think about 12 months, 24 months, 36 months. Think about those as your checkpoints. Um, and immerse yourself in in those conversations. I mean, uh, yesterday I was you know I was on MIT's website reading um, about you know, available patents that they have to be licensed. You know, I, I was just nerding out in you know in industry documents and trying to make myself knowledgeable about spaces that I've never done business in before. Um, there's no shortage of COVID stuff to read, but you know, I mean, unless in, in unless in you're like you know some incredible doctor who's doing virus research, it's probably not what your opportunity is. Um, and the real advantage is you know, how often do you get to go to work in a place where everybody else is, you know, just you know, staring at the newsfeed and, and, and not actually being productive. Like this is the time for you to focus. And um, because everybody else kind of has their, you know, their, uh, their, their head in the sand a little bit. Yeah. And honestly, especially in the tech space, look back, the, the biggest companies were formed either right after the dot-com bust in the early 2000s or at the uh, housing bust in the late 2000s. Um, yep. This is a cycle that that is, this won't be the last, right? This one's especially bigger than the last two, um, but still that just, that just means it's bigger opportunity as well. So um, a lot of people too, kind of going back on the hiring front and, and honestly, it's, it's kind of the, it's very similar question breaking through, right? All of the noise. Um, how are you finding, or like, was this all just through uh, your guys' networks, but you know, the networks, yeah, yeah. I um, mean, you know, you, you uh, this is where if if you were previously during the boom times, if you were part of an industry association, um, you know, if, if you were just out in a business, uh, you know, this is when you can start to reap the rewards of the networks that you've built. So the, the first thing that I did with uh, with with my new business partner. Um, who, by the way, I, I now have a business partner who I've never met in person. Uh, we we were introduced through a friend, and we've we've only met via uh, via Google Hangouts, and it's uh, it's kind of an interesting COVID story. But That's great. Um, you know the uh, we the very first thing that we did was we filled out an Excel spreadsheet with every person that we thought was relevant to what we might be building, and I I took. I would say it was almost two full days. So, you know, figure 20 hours worth of work where I just went through and I started to document all the people in my network, what their skill sets were, kind of categorizing them based on like uh, what business concepts do I think they'd be relevant for? Um, because those are people who are, those are the types of people who are willing to put a little bit of time in. So, and actually one of those people in my network who is a former CEO, who's a, a CEO who just recently left his company um, you know, he, he just agreed to basically spec 30 days worth of work uh, to, to kind of you know, flush out one of the business concepts. So, you know, my partner, myself, him, uh, 
a lawyer, every single one of us, had our, we're all just specking our time trying to see if this thing works. Yeah. Um, and we haven't spent or raised $1 yet. Mm -hmm. And it's a good time to call in some favors too, right? I mean, this is the time when a lot of available people are available. A lawyer right now is going to be much more available, right? Especially- John, this, is, this, is a, this is a lawyer from one of, the, one of the largest law firms in the country. Yeah. And he's like, I'll just do the work for free and, you know, and you know, it, it, in the hopes that when you guys actually go and raise a bigger round and everything, we'll do the business. But you know, the, you know, the, it probably bills out at close to a thousand bucks an hour and is just going to whip these things up for us. Um, because this is the time when you know people are extending goodwill, and it's the time when people actually have your know, capacity to extend. Um, so, mm -hmm. um, as far as so the, the new stuff that you're building, right? So you built something in 2009. Now we're we're in the next next one of these these areas or times of change, and you're building something else. I mean, um, what was you know? Stuff in 2009 was precipitated by, by a different set of circumstances. Like what are the things you're seeing right now as you build this new business? Uh, well, I mean, first for me, the, the genesis of the new business was just, a, I, I have a real passion and skill set for the you know, early stage and strategic formation uh, of, of a business, mm -hmm. you know, value proposition design, early team recruiting, um, uh, product market fit, uh, and you know, pattern recognition, things that are very valuable in the early stage. You know, I would say that you know, my own personal reflection on, on my ride at Convene was, you know, when when we were a, a larger company that had raised over a quarter billion dollars and had almost a thousand employees. I just you know, that 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 scale phase of the business life cycle just wasn't for me. So this was for me that um, you know I thought about what what my skill sets were and, and I wanted to apply them. And so the new business is a uh, it's a venture studio. So uh, it's it's a you know, we intend to start. Uh, initially two businesses a year, eventually we'll probably hit four businesses a year. And we're sourcing uh, businesses from three different areas. Uh, either it'll be thesis driven from our own observations and, and uh, thoughts about the world. It'll be talent driven where people with great business ideas come to us. Um, and then we basically back them as, you know, as experienced and seasoned uh, founders who have large networks who can uh, you know, help earlier uh, you know, Entrepreneurs that are earlier in their career, we could kind of help sure. jumpstart them. And then the the third uh, the third type of business that we start is one that starts with an intellectual property asset. So you know somebody who's a patent holder uh, or like I said a, a, a corporate um, uh, that is wanting to spin something off. You know, and then we'll you know capitalize that and basically commercialize uh, their intellectual property. So that's that's what it is. It's it's, it's a it's a venture studio. Uh, it doesn't even have a name yet. We're um, but we have two companies that we're kind of working on right now in the studio. Well, we have 607 people currently watching live from all around the world. Any, any, if anyone has a, a recommendation for a name, throw it in there in the chat. This, maybe this could be yeah. some real time, some, uh, some real time brainstorming and cut through the element for press. Um, so, looking back at 2009, you know, obviously you guys were scrappy. You, you, you. I'm sure you went through some financial hardship back then, and. and um, you know, had to keep things afloat. Um, are there, are there anything you regret from back then that, that now you think, um, you know, you, you've learned from that you can improve on that you did back then? The biggest thing I regret is worrying, uh, is just, you know, have the, have confidence that things will work out, uh, realize that your worst case scenario is, um, probably better than, wherever you're sitting now and, you know, have fun along the way. Like there, there were, there were so many times when I just was wanting the business to be at a more mature phase. Um, and you know, the, the advice that I would give myself is just like, enjoy every second of the building phase. I mean, to me, building a company is kind of like raising a child where in the beginning yeah. you have an infant that keeps you up at night and it's stressful and, you know, maybe you don't feel like the love is coming back to you as much as you do um, you know, when when the kids grow up and get older. But every single phase of the business is something that's worth uh, celebrating and worth enjoying. And, and you know, it's um, there's there's no sense in, in stressing yourself out too much. You know, and then the the other thing is, is I would say uh, you know, j just to to go bigger and move faster. You know, you realize that. Uh, you know, 
going slow and small is pretty much as much work as going, you know, uh, big and fast. Yeah. Uh, just the, you know, the, the rewards are bigger and the learning is more in the latter scenario. Uh, and so just, you know, push, push the envelope. Like there's so many times when we were at a fork in the road of, you know, should we do this? Should we not do this? And, um, you know, sometimes I wish that maybe we, we push harder. Yeah, for sure. And I'm seeing some questions here just along those lines, right? Like, so Fernando's asking, should you build your product first and hope the customers will, will come the other way around? I mean, right now is when the big companies are regrouping, right? Like you have to just move fast, throw up a, a Google form. That could be your, your, your landing page. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and like you said, you, you can make it look like it looks professional on the front end to the customer, right? Go on any of these landing page websites, Squarespace, throw up a landing page in five minutes. They, they give you their email and then you get their email and then you do whatever your service does yeah. manually. Just do it. Right. Book a book, a restaurant. Well, not a restaurant right now. It's a bad example, but you know, you could perform whatever service you want manually and then just, you know, just scrap, you do it from there because then you're, you're faster than the big companies and they're not going to be able to do that right now. Yeah. And I think the, the answer there is uh, it, it, it's not build the product and it's not sell the customer. It's actually, you, you, you want to be uh, iterating in really tight terms. So you, you don't want to go and spend 12 months building a product and then you go show it to a customer who gives you really valuable feedback. And then you go work on that for 12 months, you know, only to get a different feedback. Like the world and the market moves so fast today that you really want to be iterating your product design and development, you know, with customer feedback in, in pretty close to real time. Um, and so don't, you know, don't, don't try to build too much uh, before you sell and don't try to sell too much before you build. Uh, you kind of want to navigate, um, it, both those things pretty much simultaneously. Yeah. And, uh, you know, also when, when you are building a product that you're actively selling, but you know, it doesn't work yet. Uh, I'd also say, you know, be really honest with your customers about where you are um, because they will respect your integrity and your honesty. And it, oftentimes, um, you know, when you're asking for their advice and feedback, they become really bought into the product. And so you start to you know, gain trust with them and, and there's goodwill that's built with them. Uh, you know, don't be, sh don't, don't fall into the trap of promising things that don't exist yet uh, and telling people that they're real when they're not, because eventually you get found out, uh, you lose trust. Um, and, you know, it, and then that's, that's not a productive uh, or happy place to be. Yeah, I agree. Um, Gordana asks, and we're gonna we're gonna wrap things up in a couple of minutes here. But um, Gordana asked, you know, when you were when you were during that time, I know you know you said you went through the twenty hour process of looking through your network, and obviously there were people had different roles, right? There are people, hey, maybe I can partner with this person, maybe this person can introduce me, maybe this person should join my team. Um, you know, were, were were mentors a, a big role for you back then as well? You know, interestingly enough, I. I um I haven't had a, a ton of mentors and I, it's actually one of the only other things that I, I, I don't know if it's even a regret, but um, I, I've had a lot of coaches, which are different than mentors. Mm -hmm. um, and the coaches have helped me to be reflective and to ask myself tough questions. Um, but you know, a lot of the, the businesses that I've built, um, the advice from the incumbents, I think would have maybe steered me off my course. And, I think as somebody who tends to build a different version of what the status quo is, I've somewhat been reluctant to um, to kind of pull on industry mentors. But I, I I have asked myself if if that's a weakness and if it's something I should resolve. Um, but it just it just happens to be that I have I've had more luck personally with coaches than I have with mentors. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I, I but I know a lot of other people who've who credit mentors with like a hundred percent of their success. And so I'm not, I'm not advertising that as a good practice. That's just my personal experience. For sure. Um, a really uh, interesting question Alexa just asked here. I normally try not to pay attention to the chat cause it's moving really quickly and somebody's there kind of feeding it to me. But yeah, Alexa asked, you know, do, do you only build a business where you feel you know everything? You weren't a <laughs> real estate exactly no, it, 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 the exact opposite yeah. i uh you know when i showed up in new york i showed I, I moved from colorado i had never owned a suit in my life i showed up in cowboy boots and jeans 
Uh, and I had actually never been to a business conference before in my life. And uh, it convened is now I think the, you know, the, the largest uh, purpose-built conference company in the United States. Um, so I, I would say almost just the opposite um, is, you know, come in and look at an industry through completely fresh eyes without any type of, uh, you know, uh, preconceived understanding of how it works. And then, you know, just become a, become a student, you know, becoming a passionate expert about the business is part of entrepreneurial success uh, mm -hmm. in the long term, but is not necessarily the place where you need to start. Now, of course, there are businesses that require very specific expertise. You know, you don't want to go, uh, you know, pretend to be a heart surgeon and pop into that business tomorrow. But um, I think that generalist, general entrepreneurial skill sets uh, can be applied to all different types of businesses. Um, and then, you know, one of the things about being a layperson in an industry is that you start to really surround yourself with experts and you trust their advice. Right. Um, and so that's, you know, that, that's, that's another thing, which is, you know, you want to, you want to, recruit people that help you to see your blind spots. But like in Convene, where we kind of reinvented an element of the real estate and hospitality business, um, we did hire some industry veterans who really strongly disagreed with the things we were doing to the point where one of our most, uh, one of our early and most valuable team members quit over a decision. Uh, and the modification that we made to the business has since become widely adopted by the hospitality industry um, kind of all over the place. And it was an innovation that was uh, that we thought was obvious, but other people were just kind of stuck on the old way of doing things. And so, you know, sometimes, sometimes the status quo is that way for a really good reason. And sometimes it's that way because it hasn't been thought, thought, uh, it hasn't been recalibrated for, um, for the present. And part of an entrepreneur's skill set is understanding, you know, what legacy attributes of a business are you keeping in place? And then what are the core assumptions that are really deeply rooted and held that the incumbents are going to, you know, go crazy about when you disrupt it? You need to figure out which assumptions you're flipping on their head. Um, and typically, you know, every really disruptive business basically replaces one foundational assumption that's deeply held with some type of, uh, you know, evolved um, understanding. And then that's how new businesses get created. All right. Yeah. So in the beginning, fresh eyes over time, you want to bring in some people, but it's a good mix of, yeah, the old and the new. So I'm going to finish with one last question here because I thought it was just, just a good one. A lot of people, a couple of people have asked, like, do you have any recommendations for books? Any, any, you big reader, Chris? I'm not even sure if you are. Are you? Uh, I haven't read uh, all the books that are behind me. <laughs> oh, <no>. um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I'm more of a, uh, I'm more of a, a skimmer, but um, you know, Exponential Organizations is a great book about uh, trying to think about how to build scalable businesses. So that's one. Uh, uh, value Proposition Design uh, is, is, is another one um, uh, that really helps you to understand kind of the ecosystem of partners and factors that go into creating a successful business. Um, so I think those are two businesses, that, uh, two, two books that, um, that I would um, that I highly recommend. Awesome. Exponential organizations and uh, value proposition campus. Okay. Well, hey, everybody, thank you so much for joining. Uh, again, I mean, we still have 553 people on here right now, concurrent from all over the world, which is, which is pretty amazing. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, Chris, that was awesome. Um, and uh, we, I know it's been a lot of questions on here. Are you going to get the video? Yes, uh, we're, we'll be sending you guys a video. We're just going to crunch it up and all that good stuff. Uh, so you'll be getting the video within the next 24, 48 hours. Uh, his name is Christopher J. Kelly. J, right? Yeah. Christopher J. Kelly. Um, uh, look him up online. Check out what he's doing. And, uh, yeah, if you want to learn more about the Founder Institute, go to fi.co or check out any of our online startup events coming up at onlinestartupevents.com. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, guys. It was an honor. Take care, everybody.